title today's sermon, The Council's Decree. We're in Acts 15, and we're continuing that study. Now, last week I read all the way through verse 21, and we, we ended really, though, in verse 18. And so I'm going to pick up and read in verse 19 in just a moment and extend our reading all the way to verse 35. Now, only the Lord knows the answer to this because he wrote the Bible. But there seems to be a good reason why Acts 15 falls right at the center of this book because the Jerusalem Council was, was such a defining moment, really, in the history of the church. Perhaps the most important moment after the resurrection and, and Pentecost because in many ways the gospel itself was at stake. At least uh, that seemed to be the way the Apostle Paul saw that. Uh, a sect of the Pharisees who had come up from Antioch and perhaps even had followed Paul and Barnabas through part of their travels through Asia Minor and the, and the province of Galatia in particular, this sect of the Pharisees were insisting that without circumcision you cannot be saved. So a council was convened in the mother church in Jerusalem, the place where it all began, a place made up mostly of people with strong Jewish background. There was unlike the church in Antioch, which was a mixed church, church in Antioch contained both Jews and Gentiles, and most likely a significant number of Gentile believers, and that was a beautiful thing. At the same time, when different backgrounds and cultures meet, there's often a bit of tension as to the shape of things moving forward. And so they were trying to figure out some things in Antioch. And no doubt, that was creating some tension between the church in Antioch and the church in Jerusalem because the church in Antioch was not asking permission of the church in Jerusalem. They weren't sending communications saying, can we do this or can we do that? So the unity of the greater church was at stake. As other churches are being planted and believers from different backgrounds are, are coming into the church. But far more important than just how to negotiate cultural differences is this issue of justification and the way of salvation. I mean, when it comes to what you believe about justification, well, the very gospel is at stake with an essential doctrine like that. Is justification by faith alone? Or is it by faith plus obedience to certain aspects of the Jewish ceremonial laws, in this case, circumcision in particular? And of course, we ended last time by saying that justification or salvation is by faith alone, in Christ alone. It's not Jesus plus anything. And so let's pick up in Acts 15 and begin reading in verse 19. Now this is God's word, and the speaker here, though, is James. Therefore, my, in my judgment is that we should not trouble those of the Gentiles who turn to God, but should write to them to abstain from the things polluted by idols and from sexual immorality and from what has been strangled and from blood. For from ancient generations, Moses has had in every city those who proclaim him, for he is read every Sabbath in the synagogues. Then it seemed good to the apostles and the elders with the whole church to choose men from among them and send them to Antioch with Paul and Barnabas. They sent Judas, called Barsabbas, and Silas, leading men among the brothers, with the following letter. The brothers both the apostles and the elders, to the brothers who are of the Gentiles in Antioch and Syria and Cilicia. Greetings. Since we have heard that some persons have gone out from us and troubled you with words, unsettling your minds, although we gave them no instructions, it has seemed good to us, having come to one accord, to choose men and send them to you with our beloved Barnabas and Paul. Men who have risked their lives for the name of the Lord Jesus Christ. We have therefore sent Judas and Silas, who themselves will tell you the same things by word of mouth. For it has seemed good to the Holy Spirit and to us to lay on you no greater burden than these requirements, that you abstain from what has been sacrificed to idols, and from blood, and from what has been strangled, and from sexual immorality. If you keep yourselves from these, you will do well." Farewell. So, when they were sent off, they went down to Antioch, and having gathered the congregation together, they delivered the letter. And when they had read it, they rejoiced because of its encouragement. And Judas and Silas, who were themselves prophets, encouraged and strengthened the brothers with many words. And after they had spent some time, they were sent off in peace by the brothers to those who had sent them. 
But Paul and Barnabas remained in Antioch, teaching and preaching the word of the Lord with many others also. Father, we thank you today for your word. We acknowledge that you wrote it for us, and therefore it is inerrant and infallible and utterly sufficient. We pray that you would help us discern uh, some of the complications today as to what it is saying to us, and we ask for the help of the Holy Spirit that you might uh, open it to our understanding and that we might take it in deeply into our hearts and lives, and you might transform us by your grace. We ask that today, today in Jesus' name. Amen. Well, the Jerusalem Council, if you want to think about it this way, was kind of a triumph for the Apostle Paul. His insistence that salvation was by faith alone, apart from the works of the law, had been crucial. And these men from Jerusalem, this sect of Pharisees, as Luke calls them, these men from Jerusalem had evidently come to Antioch, and they had disturbed the souls of the brothers. Evidently, they'd followed Paul and Barnabas on on at least a portion of their missionary journeys, even causing trouble in the churches in Galatia by all accounts. And what these men were insisting is that apart from circumcision, you cannot be saved. And that was something that needed to be settled quickly. It needed to be settled clearly. It was a matter of the purity of the gospel. It wasn't an issue over which to debate. Uh, It wasn't an issue over which we can vacillate. And the, the council had been unanimous. Paul dealt with this in his letter to the Galatians, a letter that I think was probably written just before the Jerusalem council. He had written to the Galatians on this very issue. And when you read Galatians 2.16, you see Paul's primary statement about the whole matter. He says, We know that a person is not justified by works of the law, but through faith in Jesus Christ. So we also have believed in Jesus Christ in order to be justified by faith in Christ and not by the works of the law. Because by the works of the law, no one will be justified. So there it is. It's Paul, Paul's very clear on this. It's by faith alone, apart from the works of the law. And circumcision, as far as the Apostle Paul is concerned, was one of those works. Now, if you were here last week or if you were listening online, I mentioned a position briefly uh, then called the New Perspective on Paul, something that found its way into evangelical and even Reformed churches in the early 2000s. It was actually first mentioned in the late 70s, but it took a while to trickle down into the churches, and, and I said that the, the new perspective on, on Paul, aside from the fact that it, it teaches error, is that it was a little like the circumcision issue in Paul's day, because in that view, it's, it's faith in Christ, yes, but it's also plus your whole life lived. And one of the things I didn't mention last week is that many people who are promoting this erroneous view They do have a genuine concern over people who merely profess Christ and who join a church, but they have absolutely no fruit in their life. I'm concerned about that as well. So their concern is valid, but the the way they're trying to deal with the concern is by teaching error, which is absolutely horrible. The New Perspective guys were saying that justification, if it occurs, well, it, it, it only occurs on the last day, the final day of judgment, on the basis of the whole life lived. In their view, your works are meritorious and they factor into your justification in some manner. And the sign that you now might be justified on the last day is your profession of faith in Jesus, your your joining the church and participating in the sacraments. But at the core of their view, your works factor into your justification. So it's Jesus plus. Jesus plus your whole life lived. But people try to do this in every era. If if you look at church history at the time of the Reformation, it wasn't that that medieval Rome didn't believe in grace. I mean, the, the Roman church believed in grace, but it believed in grace plus the addition of works of obedience, works of the law. That that's what people do who misunderstand the purpose of the law. The reason we can't merit uh, gain favor or merit anything with God through law keeping, uh, and, and why Paul says so directly that no one will be justified through the works of the law is that in order to a- attain true righteousness through law keeping, well, it has to be perfect. The, the, the work offered in keeping with the law has to be perfect, and all of our works are always defective in both motive and performance. Ever since Adam fell in the garden, and he passed his fallen nature, his sin nature, and his original guilt onto all of us. No one can perfectly keep 
God's law on this side of heaven. Even as a redeemed person, you cannot perfectly keep God's law and therefore gain any merit with God. Of course, God's pleased when he sees his children obeying him, but you can't gain merit. You can't earn it and like stand on your own. We can't even fully understand what it means to fulfill the law as Jesus did, let alone keep it. And here this sect of Pharisees was demanding obedience to the ceremonial law in order to be saved. That, and that obedience to the ceremonial law has to be viewed as meritorious because part of that obedience, uh, apart from that, there, there was no salvation. And so Paul's addressing this issue in Antioch. And now, listening to the debate in Jerusalem, there, there at the very center of the debate are two issues. There's the issue of the relationship between the Jews and Gentiles in the church. There's no doubt about it. But converted Jews were finding it difficult to completely accept, without any question, as equals, these Gentiles that were coming in to the community of, of God. Uh, so there were growing pains. Jews had never sat beside a Gentiles at a table meal in the past, and now they're one in Christ. The dividing wall's been torn down, but they're having growing pains. Because keeping of, of the ceremonial law and circumcision, well, that had been, become the Jews' identity, basically. That, that's, that's radically different from what they were used to, and they don't like that so much. Well, there's another issue, though, fundamental issue, the issue of justification in relation to works. The issue of salvation in its relationship to obedience, like circumcision. And once the Pharisees had said, you can't be saved unless you're circumcised, well, that's over the line. That's a red flag to Paul, because they made circumcision not just a, a badge of honor if you will or something as part of their identity in being Jewish they, they'd made it a criterion of obedience without which you couldn't be saved so there's a line in the sand and the council had come out with flying colors on this one this this is a wonderful moment there's absolute agreement there's not even a hint of suggestion that the Gentiles should be circumcised in order to be saved that's crystal clear it was a triumph for the gospel, for justification by faith alone in Christ. As Luke records it in verse 11, he says, We believe that we will be saved through the grace of the Lord Jesus, just as they will. There it is. Salvation by grace alone, through the instrumentality of faith in Jesus alone, for both Jew and Gentile, no matter who you are or where you are. But then come these four stipulations. This is where it gets difficult in this passage. They should abstain from food offered to idols. They should uh, abstain from uh, sexual immorality, from meat that had been strangled, and from blood. And this list is repeated, although in a different order. It's repeated again in verse 29 in the letter itself that they sent. And it's even going to be repeated again when James and Paul, next time they're together in Jerusalem. And, and, and they repeat these four injunctions. So let's approach it this way. And here are your three main, main points today on the outline. What do these four things mean? And secondly, what is the purpose of them? And thirdly, what is the intended scope of this letter? So first of all, what do these four things mean? A couple of things we need to notice about this list of these four essentials. First of all, they, they seem to be a mix here. I mean, there's ceremonial uh, issues. There are, are moral issues here. So you have meat that's been offered to idols, meat that's been strangled. You have blood, and then you have Sexual immorality or, or fornication. Of course, sexual immorality, fornication, well, that's wrong. That's wrong no matter what time, place, era. Uh, it's always wrong. You don't need a council in Jerusalem to tell you that fornication is wrong. You don't need James and Paul and Peter and Barnabas and a whole lot of others to get together over several days and can say, hey, by the way, you need to refrain from fornication. I mean, so what does it mean? What are they, what are they saying here? Well, some suggest that what's in view here is the rules of marriage uh, within degrees of blood relationship. The fancy word for that is consanguinity. In, in Leviticus 18, it's possible you see that what's being referred to here is the way that Jews and Gentiles differ on who could marry within blood relationships. And if you go read Leviticus 18, there are more stipulations listed there than what might be obviously immoral to someone. So the thinking goes, perhaps there are, are certain practices among the Gentiles that are offensive to the Jews. I mean, John Calvin thinks that, that this stipulation to avoid 
living a sexually immoral life referred to a pagan practice of, of keeping a common law wife. Maybe that's the issue of, of sexual immorality here. I don't know, but it's, it's a pretty strong word and certainly not a word uh, designed to, to bring peace to Gentiles in Antioch, particularly if, if they were already married to these people, some of these people listed in Leviticus 18, and now they're being accused of fornication. So this interpretation seems to be a difficult one to carry through, uh, although some great names have adopted it. It's interesting that if, if, if that were the view, Leviticus, Leviticus 18 obviously follows Leviticus 17, and Leviticus 17 contains all kinds of laws about ritual sacrifice, including the issue of, of blood, but nothing about strangulation, nothing about sacrificing uh, to idols. So let's, let's go with that just for a second. I think maybe what the Jerusalem council are saying to the Gentiles, um, that they should conform to some ceremonial laws in Leviticus 17 and 18. Well, think about that for a minute. They've just said that circumcision is not necessary, but then they've, they've laid hold of four others. If that's true, it sounds like the, that Paul's going to have a lot of explaining to do back in Antioch. Notice also the word order is different. In the first account we read, fornication or sexual immorality comes second in the list. In the second account, in the letter that they sent, uh, it comes fourth. And that could be suggestive of, of several things. Perhaps putting it in the fourth category meant it was in a category all its own, as might be the case with rules of consanguinity or interpretation. But if it actually comes second in between stipulations about meat offered to idols, meat that's been strangled, then that might suggest it has some kind of relationship to the places where you might encounter things like that, like in a pagan temple, for instance. You know, in a temple that, where the converted Gentiles in Antioch and in Syria and Cilicia have been frequenting probably all their lives, except until recent weeks before they became converted. And perhaps some of them are still even toying with the idea of attending some of those rituals and those ceremonies of pagan temple worship. I mean, they probably still have some friends in those circles. And so it might be, and it looks to me as though what this letter is actually suggesting, what these four stipulations are actually suggesting, is that Gentiles in Antioch, Syria, Cilicia are to practice caution, yes. They're to be careful about matters of interpersonal relationships and and those practices like eating meat that's been strangled or stay away from, from eating blood, it, it may be that this letter is actually suggesting that there are tensions developing between converted Jews and converted Gentiles over the kinds of food that they're eating. Perhaps it's only in those areas where these cultures mesh, these cross currents, if you will, around surrounding uh, pagan worship and Jewish worship. There's some different relationships going on there where people know one another and their paths are crossing, uh, that this letter is saying, well, you know what, we're asking you to abstain. I mean, the truth is, uh, you're free to eat meat that's been offered to idols. You're free to eat meat that's been strangled. You're free to eat meat, uh, eat the blood of, of meat, but we're asking you to, to abstain for the sake of our weaker Jewish brothers and sisters in this case. It's for the sake of fellowship. I mean, it's interesting that Paul's actually going to take this up in the next two letters he writes. The letters to the Thessalonians, the letters to Corinth. And Paul takes this, this very issue. You remember, for example, in, in 1 Corinthians 8, this whole chapter about meat that's been offered to idols? Meat was an expensive commodity then. The average Joe would not have meat on a regular basis. And maybe on his way home from the office in Antioch, a, a new Christian, a Gentile, would, would pass a pagan temple where he even knew people there. He, maybe he even had once worshipped there. And, and he knows a friend who is selling meat from that temple, and it's at a discount price. And so he goes home in the afternoon. And this guy doesn't have all the ceremonial law background in his conscience. He says to himself, hey, I'm free in Christ. It's just meat. How much for that meat? So he negotiates a price. He takes it home. He cooks it, and he eats it. He doesn't ask questions for the sake of conscience. It's just a piece of meat to him. It means nothing. And then maybe he has another Christian over for dinner. Or even somebody in his own family. And somebody says to him, you know, we really shouldn't be eating that meat because that meat's been offered to idols. That's connected to idolatry. Now, they're wrong, of course, because an idol is nothing. It's just meat. But their conscience 
In their conscience, it's something else. And so you remember how Paul deals with that. Remember how he deals with it in 1 Corinthians 8 and how he deals with it again in Romans 14. He says, you know, in, place, in situations like that where you have a weaker brother and the weaker brother is the one who has the problem, and you could put anything in there today where, where we, have, uh, we have freedom, but we've got to be careful. You just take, take alcohol, for instance, or, where some people uh, whose conscience is weak and you're going to go with them somewhere, you're going to be in, in fellowship with them in social situations, well, it might be a good idea to, to abstain because not out of a principle of bondage, but actually the very opposite. The very fact that you are free in Christ and you're going to abstain from your freedom for the sake of your weaker brother or sister. Now, of course, that doesn't deal with the issue of sexual immorality or fornication. That's why I said this list is problematic. Uh, there was plenty of that in pagan worship. There's plenty of cultic prostitution within pagan temples. Maybe that is the issue. It's intriguing to watch the transmission of our text here in Bibles. A difficulty, a thorny issue to deal with. And, and so much so that some traditions are struggling over the issue of sexual immorality. And if that was the intended uh, word there in the text. And how to even bring it in and deal with it. So there, there's a lot of wrestling there. But however way you view it, what was the concern being shown here in Jerusalem? Well, they did have a concern for the the peace of the church, the purity of the church, for holiness, for close relationships in the church. It seems to me that it was not a concern to impose Jewish ceremonial laws among the Gentiles. Not that. Because that would be going back to bondage, for which the Jerusalem Council had been called for in the first place. And also we know um, all food's clean, you know, from the New Testament and the other things that will be said and written about in the New Testament. So what's the purpose of these stipulations? That's the second point this morning we want to talk about. They write this letter. It's taken up to Antioch. To Antioch. It begins by saying, Those who had come to you from Jerusalem, they bore no authority from us. But these men, Sil uh, Judas and Silas, they bear our full authority. And we are in total agreement on this. Interestingly, though, Paul seems absolutely silent. He doesn't speak in Jerusalem. At least nothing's recorded for us in Luke's account. And nothing's recorded either when he gets back to Antioch, that Paul was completely and utterly on board with every part of this. Maybe this is the part of a compromise in, de in delicate relationships between a largely Gentile church and a largely Jewish church, where Paul, for the sake of the unity of the church here, has decided to keep his peace. Because the moment he would speak, begin to speak, there would be factions in the community. If this letter is a means of pacifying Jews by asking Gentiles in Antioch to submit to Jewish ceremonial laws, then it would seem that that would, that would be a compromise. So I think the way what might be happening here in the church in Jerusalem is addressing those areas of tension between the largely Gentile Christians and those converted Jewish Christians as those lines kind of crisscross some of those Spheres of influence and those circles are mixing. There are certain pagan practices that may not even be inherent. They're not necessarily sinful and that involve food that would be an enormous offense to a Jewish Christian. And rather than stick to your gun, stick to your liberty, and they, it, they would ask them to refrain and abstain for the sake of the greater good and the unity of the brethren. Because meat offered to idols and blood and all that that's, that's strangled, I mean, that's a matter of adiaphora. And that which, that which is adiaphora biblically has to do with matters that in and of themselves inherently, intrinsically have no particular moral bearing. But where an issue of conscience and scruple is taking place, it's asking for the sake of the unity of the brothers to refrain. It, it's interesting, isn't it, in verse 21? It's kind of awkward text. For Moses from ancient generations has in every city those who preach him since he is read in the synagogues every Sabbath. There are some who interpret that text to be saying that what's being said here is the Jews didn't need to be taught because they were already being taught week by week. It was the Gentiles who were ignorant about certain practices. But rather what's being said in that text is this. How can you expect Jews suddenly overnight to lose all their scruples about certain things when they have been taught all along in the synagogues and every week as they attend that it's necessary to obey these things. I think that's probably more, more what's being said here. And now that they've gained their freedom in Christ, it, it takes time, as it were, uh, 
for these things to seep out of their consciousness as converted Jews. Now, thirdly, this morning, what, what is the scope of this letter? What's the, what's the intent? Uh, let me point out just a few things quickly. You notice how it begins by calling themselves brothers and they're addressing brothers here. It's from brothers to brothers. And what a wonderful, winsome touch that is. It, in a case where there's tension between Jerusalem and Antioch, it's brother to brother speaking. Notice, too, uh, that the letter addresses Paul and Barnabas as our beloved Paul and Barnabas. Now, they were certainly beloved in Antioch. It might be open to question as whether Paul was being beloved in Jerusalem or not. But the letter says, beloved Paul and beloved Barnabas. Notice, too, that the letter says, what we're asking you is only the minimum. We're not imposing on you some great burden. We're asking you for the sake of the unity of the brothers to abide by these four things. And notice, too, it's a very localized letter. And that's probably what I want to focus on for a moment. For example, it's not addressed to the churches in Galatia. It's only addressed to the church in Antioch and Syria and Cilicia up in the north. And maybe this letter was always intended to be local and, and temporary, uh, temporary arrangement was made as the church grew, and in the course of that growth, experienced growing pains. And that's kind of where I'm leaning after I've wrestled with this passage all week. There, there are a lot of difficult issues here. There's, there's the issue itself. There's, there are personalities. Imagine being in the same room with Peter, James, the half-brother of Jesus, Paul, and Barnabas. And you notice how the letter says, on the one hand, it's the work of the Spirit. And then on the other hand, it seemed good to us also. They had deliberated these things. God didn't just, just pour it out of heaven. It wasn't just a, a thus saith the Lord. No, this had been agreed to by debate, counsel, deliberation, influence of, of wisdom and logic and reason and urging. And yet over the entire process, Holy Spirit was overseeing and guiding. And the Spirit brings peace to their hearts and says it seemed good to us also. And I think that's what Luke wants us to see. That, that, that however much concern... There was in Antioch and Jerusalem for the church, and the concern, of course, is for the purity of the gospel, and for interpersonal relationships between converted Jews and Gentiles as the church continues to grow and more people from different backgrounds come into it. The Spirit is far more concerned than any of them to bring glory to Jesus. That's his role. That's his prerogative. That's what he, he, he exists to do, to point out Christ and to bring glory to Christ. But in situations where the church finds itself in tension and in difficulty and unsure of the way ahead, well, this is always the promise, isn't it? That as elders discuss and debate and deliberate and try to inch forward in situations where there's tension and difficulty, uh, where there's no thus saith the Lord in certain situations, trying to find the way of wisdom, trying to understand and, and follow God's guidance, there's this promise of the work of the Spirit whose constant ministry is to bring glory to Jesus. So let's pray together. Father, we thank you again for your word and for this greatly important passage. It speaks to us about the relationship between two churches and the relationship between individuals who are now free in Christ, and yet for the sake of unity, there's refraining from using that liberty for a, a better motive and a better goal. So we pray, Lord, in circumstances where we find ourselves over issues where there are no directives from you, that we might exercise similar patience and love and Christ-like concern for our brothers and sisters in Christ. Lord, we ask for your blessing. We pray for your guidance this day as we depart. And we thank you in Jesus' name. Amen.